Thank you. Um, it's great to be back in Accra. Oh. It's great to be back in Accra. And um, I'm especially excited about this panel, um, Bitcoin versus traditional payment systems. I think we're going to have a great conversation today. I also have a special request. Uh, somebody approached me yesterday and said, the panels have been a little tame so far, so can we get this spicy? Oh. So I'm looking at you guys uh, for some little spicy comments. Right. So let's take this away. <clears throat> um, much of what we think about when we think about traditional finance systems today was actually set up in 1944. And um, this infrastructure was built at a conference where less than 50 countries came together to establish two things. One, the US dollar as the global reserve currency. And two, the global settlement system that we know today. That system didn't contemplate the fact that we would have 195 countries or over 150 currencies. And it certainly didn't contemplate the internet. And so we have this ugly Frankenstein of payment, um, payment service providers, networks, banks, exchanges. And each one of these intermediaries limits access and increase costs. And whilst we've seen the amazing innovation that the internet has brought, very little of that has happened in financial services. Uh, we've seen a lot of fintechs who have been tinkering at the edges, improving user experiences and slick, clever UIs, but it's still built on legacy infrastructure. And today, we have an opportunity with this unique paradigm to have payment rails on blockchain. So I want to dive into this, and I'm excited to unpack with you guys. Uh, before we get started, I'd love to do an introduction. Can you tell me a little bit um, your name, your company, what you're working on? and um, if your company is doing anything in Africa today or would like to do so in the future, I'm going to start with you, Emily. OK, putting me in the hot seat, Lawrence. Uh, my name is Emily Chu, and I'm here with my team at Block. So Block is an ecosystem of businesses, including Cash, Cash by Cash App, Square, which has empowered many millions of sellers to access payments that couldn't previously. Um, we have a team here from Spiral that's doing incredible things to catalyze the Bitcoin ecosystem and making it easier for people to build. Um, we have Tidal, and finally we have TBD, which is the business unit that I'm representing today. We founded TBD about a year and a half, two years ago, really with a vision of leveraging the power of decentralized technologies to return ownership and control to everyone over their finances, over their data, and over their identity. Um, this is a pretty huge vision that we have for rewriting the internet, um, bringing it back to a lot of its original principles. And we're doing so by building infrastructure, open source infrastructure, that's gonna make it easy for developers to build the next wave of incredible applications. A lot of the primitives that we're working on are focused on crypto payments, um, they're focused on decentralized identity and building a decentralized identity layer for the internet. We're looking into building an open source self-custody wallet that can hold people's identities. And part of our portfolio is also focused on lightning infrastructure in the form of lightning service providers. So we're really thinking about the whole stack of technologies that are required to make it really easy for people around the world to build really with a vision of ultimately connecting anyone to the global economy who wishes to participate. Thanks. I'm Shah. I'm the founder of NOAA. You can find more about us on NOAA.com. Um, we are set to build the world's simplest money app. And obviously, it has to be built on Bitcoin and Lightning. Um, when I looked at the market you know, two years ago, I found that you know, all the products were very, very complicated. 
and also the messaging. You know, let's start with like the branding, messaging, the way we communicate with users. And for, for me, it was very obvious to call the company Noah because the narrative is what we are doing here is we're building Noah's Ark um, to save everyone from the currency flood that is coming. And unlike the other Ark, this Ark has space for everyone. <laughs> so, you know, I think we, the, the entire team is like tirelessly working towards, you know, constantly innovating on user experience, making things so simple. You know, we talk a lot about education, but education doesn't mean, you know, release more blogs. We also have to make things so simple that they don't even have to learn new things, right? You know, we had a discussion about public-private keys. Well, do customers need to interact with them all the time? Because we know public-private keys are uh, a thing that has been uh, uh, around for a while, and, and it's part of the internet for, for quite, quite some time. But we don't interact with them on a daily basis, so why should we when we are you know, dealing with uh, the money app? So yeah, that's kind of us, and uh, excited to be part of this panel. Awesome, thank you. Dred? Yes, thank you. Um, Hello, everyone. I'm Dredd, a Bitcoiner first. And I, I host a podcast called One Love Bitcoin, which tries to talk to one person that's a Bitcoiner from every country in the world and tell that country's story. I try to get that out there. So I've already done um, the countries in Africa, Senegal, Ethiopia, Togo. Thank you, Farida. And I, I would hope to do a lot more since I'm meeting a lot of amazing people here. I'm also a developer. I work for Start9 Labs. Starna Labs creates a, a sovereign personal server that allows us to run open source software such as your Bitcoin Core node, your Lightning node, and um, the, the most exciting project I'm working on right now that'll be very relevant to this conversation is our, um, our open source uh, packaging of Fedi, as that is a powerful combination between um, sovereign hardware and privacy protecting software. So um, that's what I'm working on now. Thank you. Hello. Um, so my name is Obi Nwosu. I'm um, the CEO and one of the founders of Fedi. And Fedi is a commercial company that's aimed at taking Fedi Mint, this protocol for um, custody that's secure and, and private, and take it to mass global adoption. Um, with this missing piece, combined with Lightning and, of, of course, Bitcoin, we believe we can get to billions of users using Bitcoin over the coming years. Um, and we are, with Fedi, providing three things. Uh, we call it code, consolidation, and campaigning. So code is, is an app which we believe will be one of the simplest apps out there powered by community. It will have incredible features solving the problem of, for example, how do I back up my private keys? How do I deal with without a complicated process? Um, how do I do many other features which we'll come and explain in the coming months? But then there's consolidation. We take the best of the Bitcoin ecosystem and put it in one place. There are many different elements of Bitcoin which solve problems for people today. People don't know about them. We will make that clear. And finally, campaign. Across, although this is a global product, we think the first markets for this will be the global south. It will be Latin America. It will be Africa. It will be post-Soviet regions. And we plan to have people all across these regions educating people on Fedi and the wider Bitcoin and Lightning ecosystem to make sure we get to global adoption in the coming few years. Great. Thank you. All right. Let's get into it. So as an African, I can bear witness to the mismanagement of fiscal and monetary policies that have resulted in annual double-digit inflation and double-digit currency devaluation, and an inability to connect a global economy, exploitative remittance companies that charge the people who, have, who charge the most to the people who have the least. What role can Bitcoin play in enabling economic empowerment for people around the world who work hard but still find themselves locked out of the traditional financial systems. What have been the most powerful real life use cases in your work? Sha, I'm gonna start with you. Me? Um, so, you know, we have over you know, 400,000 people on the wait list currently, mostly emerging market. And what we often seen is that, you know, besides that they wanna store value and they understand the concept of it, is that they wanna make payments, which we all know about, but also they see in Bitcoin as a way of making money, you know, like, so in terms of economic empowerment, I would say, you know, 
with the internet re today, you can get educated, you can get some software education, um, like open source, as Jack mentioned, you can you know, teach yourself anything, and then you can just plug into the economy and say, you know what, I'm just gonna code this, you know, uh, maybe a tenth of the price of a San Francisco engineer, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna get paid in Bitcoin, right? And I think that wasn't possible before, right? So we can employ anyone in the world, pay them daily, hourly, and uh, without any friction. And I think this is one of the most important things because it just opens so many opportunities. And don't underestimate the fact that if 10 guys do that, the world, the world will get out, yeah. right? So they will, you know, let's, let's give an, Lebanon as an example, like people, you know, going through a lot of hardship there. And they're, you know, Lebanese are, as I know them, they're very smart people. And, you know, some have started to, you know, work on Gigster uh, or some engineering um, freelance platforms and get paid in Bitcoin. And then the world got out and more people started saying, hey, how can I get that? Because, you know, there is no way to work in their local market. So I think that is the most, uh, my opinion, like powerful idea that you can, you know, include everyone into the economy. Awesome. Yeah. Emily? I think Bitcoin and decentralized technologies are gonna fundamentally shift the paradigm for global finance in ways that are incredibly exciting, incredibly empowering, and bring a lot more access to people. Um, globally, we see over 1.7 billion people who are completely unbanked. They have absolutely no connectivity to the banking system, no ability to get insurance, get credit, um, participate as a global citizen in any way. The majority of these people are women, and so if we're talking about uplifting people, empowering people, it really starts with giving them the fundamental tools to even be able to participate in the economy. Um, the work that we're doing at TBD, I'm very excited about. Just on a personal level, my mother fled um, a, a revolution when she was two. Her mother had four children with her that she was carrying along with gold that she was trying to get out of the country. And that was the best way for them to try to preserve wealth and make a new life for themselves. And to this day, their passport still has the incorrect information. Um, and it was very hard for them to reestablish themselves, um, preserve wealth, get set up in a new country. And I'm really excited about a world with a lot of the technologies that TBD is catalyzing that many developers can build. Um, because it enables a world where you could really just go to the internet so long as you have a cell phone and internet access and two-thirds of that 1.7 billion people who are unbanked do have a cell phone with internet access. Download a self-custody wallet, set up your own decentralized identity and get it verified. Um, be able to immediately have a self-custodial way to hold Bitcoin or stablecoin depending on what you're trying to solve for. Um, and send money globally to your friends and family, send money across borders to access global commerce. And that's just such an empowering vision of a world that involves no permission needed to do that, no intermediaries that you have to um, overcome hurdles in order to get that permission. Um, it's just completely empowering for people to do so in ways that displaced people, whether it was in my mother's generation um, or today, many displaced peoples around the world um, can finally have the tools to participate in the global economy. Awesome, thank you. Obi? Um, so um, we, we like to say that we have, we take an approach called human-centered design. Uh, it was popularized by an organization called IDEO. Um, and this means getting on the ground and talking to people and understanding what they, their needs are, wherever they are. So that, that does mean not spending much time at home because you're doing a lot of travel. Um, and just before here, I was in El Salvador for a, adopting Bitcoin, and now I'm here. We have members of our team who have been on the ground in the favelas, in the shanty towns, wherever they may be, for a number of years, trying to get people to adopt Bitcoin. Um, we have the benefit of, um, I'm blessed to have input from a number of people who've rolled out products successfully across Africa. And we hear three things. Um, one is um, people already understand digital electronic payments, but can those payments be done in a lower cost way? That is quite powerful. You go up a tier. The next is people want to find ways to get money from the diaspora, from friends and family from abroad, 
at a lower cost in a more convenient way, more consistently, not having to go through the hoops that they have to do and pay the high fees. So that takes you up another tier. This is something that people want. And then the highest is people want ways, if you look at um, search terms for people from the lowest economic strata across Africa, the most popular search term is how to earn money, how to make money, how to work. People want to work, people want to earn. So finding ways to help people earn. So what you notice with all of these, no one mentions the word Bitcoin. Now Bitcoin can help in all three, but what we do from an impact point of view is we focus on helping people solve these three problems. And then second, we discuss Bitcoin. We just solve it with Bitcoin. We just get to the solution. So, but out of the three, um, I'm excited about all three, um, but, but um, earning money is definitely the most interesting. There are ways right now with um, services in the Bitcoin ecosystem where people can earn two, three, four dollars an hour. And by doing tasks, data annotation tasks for AI, for example, um, I was just in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago. Again, a large AI company is interested in helping. They need help with the amount of data annotation they used to do. And they have challenges. How do they pay people? The answer is Bitcoin. It's lightning. And we can be part of that solution, all of us here. And I'm incredibly excited about that because when you tell people the idea that they can start earning these significant amounts of money 24-7, guess what? When are, how often are they going to do that? every waking hour and how many people are they going to tell about it? Everyone they know. And we will get to hyper-Bitcoinization very fast. Yeah, um, I guess in my island of Jamaica, it's, it's very similar to here, um, where a lot of people are looking for that opportunity to, to earn, to interact with the rest of the world. And um, in Jamaica, we are considered high risk in terms of our financial system. So a lot of uh, other companies or other banking systems do not interact with our banking system. We are effectively isolated in, in, in the most part from, from a lot. Like you can't go and trade on Wall Street if you have a Jamaican credit card or debit card. You can't, you can't sign up to Binance or, well, not FTX, they're closed, um, or Coinbase or anywhere else. Like you, you're, just, you're not allowed to do that with your current bank account. And this is a bank account that you have in Jamaica have been privileged to use because you've you know, gotten your ID and you've filled out a form and a lot of people in Jamaica can't even fill out that form. So I looked at the lowest common denominator when I was there and tried to figure out, okay, the person who does not have a bank account, the person who does not have a government ID, the person who still wants to interact with the rest of the world financially, how do they do it? And the only solution that I've seen so far is Bitcoin and Lightning. And I mean, there are there's tools like this that can show you a person on the side of the road selling their wares without an internet connection, without power, can use an offline lightning invoice and collect fees. We were at the beach with um, some of the Fedi team and the Bitcoin Akasi team, and I bought this from a guy that did, knew nothing about Bitcoin at all. He was talking to us. And by the time I negotiated the price, um, Renata from the Fedi team already educated them on how to download a Lightning wallet and how to use it, and he collected the money in Lightning. So, so the education is the first part. Once people want to learn and they are, they're, they're excited to learn, but the education has to come first. And I, I feel like as long as we put education in front of everything we're doing and let people understand what they're doing, understand the responsibility of of holding their own keys, or if they're doing custodial, they understand how to use it, then you know, we're going to do the rest ourselves. So critics outside the Bitcoin ecosystem are skeptical of the claim that Bitcoin can address local inflation, pointing to the asset's volatility and price drop over the past year. Do you see Bitcoin playing a role in helping normal people preserve their wealth? Sean, you want to go? Yeah, um, I think whenever we have a new technology coming up, we need to be a bit more patient. Um, you know, Bitcoin's volumes and market caps are compared to a top five or top 10 FX is like a drop in the ocean. And um, the question we need to ask ourselves is, is the problem that we have, which is the price volatility, is this gonna be a temporary problem or is this gonna be a, a, a you know, problem that's gonna stick around? So I think it's a temporary problem. It's something that is gonna you know, um, get better with time. 
um, if more adoption is happening, where, where people are actually using Bitcoin to um, pay, store, you will see less volatility. Right now, a lot of the use case has been you know, trading companies and exchanges. And I think um, as soon as you start to see just a glimpse of some stability, you will see a massive inflow of capital. So I think it's just like one of those where it's slowly like creeping up and then it's going to you know, compound very fast. So I think just need to be patient. And you know, I think many technologies, if you look back, um, internet or um, you know, some of the others are before my time. But um, there were, at the time, there were so many critics, right? Yeah. So how, why would you make a transaction on the internet? It was so much you know, fraudulent. Your credit card details would be stolen. But these are all problems that can be worked on and are being worked on. So I think we just need to be patient. We know there is a lot of people working on it. You know, more and more people are getting recruited, um, you know, daily, yearly, and um, and I think it's a matter of time and until this is going to be sold. So in the meantime, we're working with stable coins, which is a great way to get people into Bitcoin. And as soon as Bitcoin becomes more stable, you'll see more people actually are choosing more for Bitcoin. We're so early, yeah, <laughs> Emily. Um, we have a very similar perspective to the one that was just shared. Um, the way we see the world, we're very much pragmatists at TBD that are trying to solve real problems for real people. And in order to solve real problems for real people today, it, it begs for a recognition that we don't yet live in a Bitcoin native world. Um, you can't pay taxes in Bitcoin. You can't pay for groceries in Bitcoin yet. Um, and so for us, the reality is that today, the US dollar is still the reserve currency of the world. We believe that in the future, Bitcoin will be the new reserve currency. And to the earlier point, I really think that stable coins are the bridge. And so with what we're building with TBD and TBDEX, the liquidity protocol, a lot of this is allowing people to very easily hold either stable coin or Bitcoin along with their decentralized identity in a self-custody wallet. Um, they can off-ramp when they choose, they can on-ramp when they choose, um, and it's really recognizing that we live in two different worlds, one that's nascent and very promising and exciting, and then the reality of the world that we live in today. And if we want to onboard the next billion people into the benefits of Bitcoin and decentralized technologies, the bridges that we're building to on-ramp and off-ramp and to hold Bitcoin and stablecoin today um, are the ones that are going to help get people there. Um, well, I'll answer that with a, a story. So when I was born, and I'm showing my age, hair's <laughs> shaved so you can't see it, but um, around the time I was born and a few years after, um, <coughs> one US dollar was worth less than one Naira, um, one Nigerian Naira. Now, one US dollar is worth 400, depending on the market, if it's Eight, the official 800. price or the unofficial price. <laughs> It's how much have you given it now? 800. It huh? 800. 800. So my, my data is at least of, uh, like six or seven months old now. 800 Naira. And in that same time, the US dollar has lost value as well. And Nigeria is one of the best performing economies in Africa. So to answer your question, if I had the choice between a currency that's volatile but tends to go up in value over time versus a currency that stably goes down in value, I know what I would choose and I know what most intelligent Africans would choose. So absolutely, Bitcoin can help people as an inflation hedge over the long term. I, and I would just add to that that when these critics do the comparison, they usually compare Bitcoin to the dollar they don't compare it to the uh, 130 Naira. currencies outside the top 20 mm -hmm. that actually are in increasingly more volatile than Bitcoin. Dread. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, there's not much to add to that, but you know, except that you have to really remember that we're, we're dealing with um, a, a wide range of people that have some no savings, some a bit of savings, some people that are thinking about their future in terms of what's tomorrow look like versus thinking about my future in terms of what next week or next year or what my kids' futures look like. And when we're talking about people that, can, that have the privilege of thinking about what my kids' future looks like, they can, 
you know, they can think about the, the benefits of Bitcoin and the long-term trend that we've seen, you know, the 200% year-over-year average um, uh, going up. But if we're thinking about somebody that is thinking about tomorrow, we really have to explain that, you know, to your point, using something more stable like a stable coin, but still having the benefits of instant final settlement and, and instant on-ramp, off-ramps are, are going to be much more beneficial than using a currency that is, that is dying on you. Um, and also having the, the, the slowness of a, a traditional banking system to boot with the dying currency. So, you know, it's just a matter of making sure that we speak the person's language in terms of their time preference. And that way they can understand that what the little that they can save can be saved in a strong, sound money currency. And then what they need to spend, they can spend it in the existing system that they're using. I want to dive a little bit more into cross-border remittance and the potential opportunity here. How do you think Bitcoin can play a critical role in this space? Obi, you want to take this one first? Um, I guess the, we've already saw, we saw it an incredible uh, announcement earlier today from uh, a, an agreement between Bitnob and Strike. And this is really powerful for me because we're all about community and the Bitcoin community, when it comes together, is invincible. Um, but just from an experiential point of view, if we compare the various different levels that you have to go to transfer money from Europe to Africa, for example, or from the US to Latin America, the number of gatekeepers, the number of rent seekers in that process and replacing that with one decentralized, fair, and open platform, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's an incredible opportunity. Right? Agreed. Yeah, I agree. It's, um, I mean, to your point, everything that was announced today kind of answers the question, but you have to think about what, what impact will that have long term, right? We're talking about eventually replacing an entire global settlement system and what does that entail? That entails security, that is, that is securing that settlement system. That is not just financial security and, and human resources that are being used to, to accounting, but it's also in terms of you know, being able to protect that global reserve currency, the military industrial complex that is being paid for to do that, the billions of dollars being spent every year to, to maintain that status in the world. All of that is being replaced eventually if you look at it that way, right? And, and it's being replaced with something that's better, something that's more scalable. And we're talking about something that can outpace Visa as we grow the, net, the Lightning Network. We're talking about something that is extensible because you can't build on top of Visa. You can build on top of the Lightning Network. You can have layer three, layer four. Um, we're talking about something that can provide open source hardware to be used on top of it as well. So it's just blue sky. Like, I don't even know what the po potential future is, but I do know that it's, it's it's um, something that we should be excited about because we're going to be building on it together, everybody here in this room, and we're going to be replacing a system that is not only bloated and spending billions of dollars, but also dying. Yeah, I mean, remittance is really, for me, um, you know, we talked about adoption, we're talking about volatility. We know they're all temporary issues and they're going to be fixed, but remittance is really one of the killer apps, right? So I think if we just, when we all just, because like, with the internet, it was the same thing. Like all the ideas were brains from 1995, but everything has to, you know, occur based on what you know something else happening. And I think if we just focus on getting remittance and payments right, we'll we'll that's will then you know get more. I would say price stability, and price stability will make more store of value. So I think it's 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 a very important use case. And um, anyone who uses Lightning and sends someone something ridiculous as small as as 10 cents and just it lands in a second, you then understand, like, wow, this can change the world, right? And, and, and will change the world. And, and I think um, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, I think, um, of course, there's a lot of angles about it, but I think just to make it so simple, right? Like, do people need to really know what Lightning is or should it just work, yeah. you know? And should people uh, share public keys or should they, you know, share email identifiers? I know you guys are working on a decentralized identity layer. We are using you know, um, lightning addresses. Um, so I think there is a lot of work to be done there. And, but the use case is there, like I can see it, but it's just 
there's the friction, right, where we have to teach someone what lighting is. But as soon as they understand, and that has been my experience, they're all hooked. And I think if we can do more work there uh, in terms of packaging it right, market it right, get more people on, onto it, we'll do a lot for Bitcoin. So at Block and TBD, we see remittances as one of the most compelling and exciting use cases that we're building for. And for us, it's not theoretical. Our mission and purpose is one of economic empowerment. And there's nothing more empowering than looking across the continent, seeing that close to 30% of GDP comes from the form of personal remittances. And recognizing that today, people are sending on average $200 to $300 dollar, dollar amounts, and they could be paying upwards of 30% of fees. The highest um, are in countries like Nigeria and Tanzania, um, but across the continent, even in lower rate countries, we're still talking about 10%, 15% of fees. Um, I was at dinner last night and having drinks with a woman who started a virtual accelerator. Um, and as part of provisioning internet access, she gives people stipends, $50 stipends to the 500 participants um, every month in order to afford internet. Um, and in order to facilitate these payments, she told me she was paying $25 in fees on every single $50 transaction across 50, 500 participants every month. Um, that is an egregious amount of profit taking to be able to facilitate internet access to empower people. Um, and that's something we're really, really excited about solving for TBD. And for us, it's not theoretical. Um, we actually demonstrated internally the first proof of concept. Um, we started in Latin America and we were able to demonstrate moving one US dollars into 20 pesos instantly, cheaply using USDC um, and crypto rails as the translation and as the payment rail. Um, and the best part about this is the end recipient doesn't even need to know anything about crypto. Just like you don't need to know how your car's engine works in order to drive it. All that person needed to know was they were able to go to all the different pickup locations they're used to, whether that's cash pickup, their bank account, or if they're unbanked, um, a stored balance in a fintech app. And they were able to pick up their pesos like instantly at much lower cost. And we see this as a first proof of concept that can be replicated in many other countries. Um, we see huge applications here across the continent. Um, we're open source, and so we don't intend to have a monopoly on this. In fact, um, we want to give it away. We want to give away our playbook. We want to give away our open source technology and the primitives that allow people to build. Um, and our call to action here is really to ask all the developers in the room who see these problems locally to come join us contribute to our open source code, leverage our open source code to build solutions like this, because this is how we're going to change the financial system and empower people together. All right, so, so far all I've heard is green sky, blue sky, <laughs> green field, amazing opportunity, like, I would really like us to talk about what could kill us next. So when I think about Bitcoin, I think of it as this very nascent, embryonic um, baby, whatever. And, and um, it needs nourishment, but it also needs time. And there are many threats to Bitcoin. I wonder if you've given any thought. I know Obi and I have had conversations, so he's probably going to kick this off. But we've had many conversations around threats to Bitcoin. Um, maybe you want to start, Obi, and, and kick that off. In the past, I've had many views on this, but I, I think the only real threat to Bitcoin now is a lack of unity within the Bitcoin community. And that wasn't a, an intended rhyme, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, we have all the elements in place now. We have all the elements in place to succeed. But we have to work together. This is why things like BitNob and, and Strike working together um, and is, is really great to see. 
Um, this is why Fedi was set up. There's a power in the community of activists and human rights defenders, an energy which, um, they, which I, they educated me to make me realize that I am also an activist. I'm activists using different tools, but if we can come together, we can bring Bitcoin to the world. And now, there are various threats. There are threats from um, the establishment. Whether it's the old establishment or the new establishment in a different clothing, the, the, the altcoin clothing. Um, but we have the tools with Lightning, we have the tools with Fediment to allow us to take custody of exchanges because exchanges are great, but ultimately, if you do not have access outside of an exchange of, of the majority of Bitcoin, then we will not be able to win this war. And then there are other things that we need to do. We need to add functionality to Bitcoin, to the Bitcoin ecosystem, extend it. And there are people working on that, that as well. So we've, all these things can be done, but we have to work together. If the community doesn't work together, we will fall. But if we stand together, we will succeed. And I know Bitcoin will succeed from the energy I've seen here in Africa, across the global south. Dread. Um, yeah, I, I'm going to push back a little bit on your description of Bitcoin being nascent or embryonic. I think, I think um, Bitcoin was embryonic uh, when the cypherpunks were, you know, riffing on it and, and critiquing it and, and in the chat rooms trying to build it and no one knew about it. And there were, you know, 10 miners back then. And I think it became a, a petulant child in the early days of, you know, the Mt. Gox and the crash. I mean, that's still happening now, actually. But you know, it was it was still not on the radar of a lot of the big um, potential uh, enemies of of Bitcoin. And I think now Bitcoin has gotten into a, a place where it, it can defend itself. To, to Obi's point, it's there's not many more um, enemies left except a few final bosses, because it's now almost a young adult that's um, finding its feet. And um, the one enemy or not enemy, the one um, attack vector that I was worried about for a long time is mainly apathy. Apathy across the you know, general society's consensus of how they think about money and how they think about you know, how much control they have over their money. Um, you know, my concern is that they, they'll not even try to have that extreme responsibility of their value, of their time value. But my opinion of that is rapidly changing as I, as I talk to people here in Africa, in Ghana, um, and other countries and realize that the apathy that I thought is not, is not present. People are excited, people are motivated, people want this to work, and people who don't even understand what Bitcoin is understand that there's a problem and are trying to fix it already. So I don't think there's many, many weak points left here, and, I'm, and I know that Bitcoin will win. So I... Um, I very much agree with Obi as well on unity. So I think we've seen this in, you know, in the past as well. If you want to bring down a group of people who have a mission, be it a state or a nation, you'll always try to you know, instill internal voids between them. And then I think when I see right now in Bitcoin, um, there's obviously increasing anger, right? And, and, and you know, a lot of people spending time arguing and fighting each other but we have to also be patient because, you know, Obi, when I talked to you yesterday, you know, when you first read the white paper, you were also skeptical, right? You were like, that's not going to happen, right? So, so I think everyone has the same journey, you know? It takes people years to get into this, and we have to be patient. We don't have to judge people very quickly. We need to try to, like, um, give them some time, you know? Um, um, and, and I think, you know, when you come from different industries, let's say more mature industries, as founders and builders, you're kind of used to this zero-sum game mm -hmm. because the market is not really expanding, so you can only win by you know, taking market share, right? Whereas when I, when I joined the, this ecosystem, I realized it's not a zero-sum game. Everyone is very <laughs> willing to help each other because we're really doing something that changes uh, humanity for good. And, um, and you can see that in the spirit of all the interactions. 
where you know people are hiding information. You know, every, everyone is sharing. You know, people like TBD are sharing everything online, and I think we just need to double down more on it. You know, like um, even you know the all the you know fights between Bitcoin and all the other people who have gone into crypto, and you know, I mean these were curious people, and I think you know of course they've been mis misled and might have done stuff that was wrong, but I think we are all humans and we make a lot of mistakes. So I think we need to really, um, you know, try to be understanding, bring more people. It takes time for people to get into it. Everyone goes through the same journey. It takes years. It's kind of like an enlightenment, an enlightenment uh, journey. Um, and try to not spend too much time fighting over Twitter on some sub, <laughs> um, you know, trying to win every argument, but yeah. instead just build and, and share ideas and, and um, and that's, I think that's just the only thing that can uh, make us win. And, you know, if I was uh, someone who was against Bitcoin, I would try to, like, fire up that fight and make, make people fight more. And that's, that's what we don't want. Mm -hmm. Yep. Emily, what keeps you up at night? Um, you know, I think to your point, I think when we bring more women into crypto, we'll stop seeing these dumb fights on Twitter. Um, yes. Or at least it'll, it'll be drastically agree, agree. reduced, right? Um, you, you asked me to be spicy, so I'm bringing the spice. Um, <laughs> And so I, I really think three things need to happen. Um, Obi talked about utility, that's one. Um, the second piece is around usability and just really making these technologies much more easy to use, access, adopt. Um, and the third piece is representation, right? Um, a lot has been talked about utility. Um, on usability, I mean, I remember the first time I was trying to manage my seed phrase and I downloaded this thing called, it was like a crypto fireproof steel. And when the package arrived in the mail, it contained two pieces of metal, a hammer, um, a little packet of how to translate your seed phrase into Morse code. And then very inscrutably, it also came with matches and earplugs. Um, and so as I was unboxing and trying to figure out what does this have to do with managing my seed phrase, I soon realized that the goal was to um, convert your seed phrase into like the dots, the Morse code, um, and then take the hammer to the steel and chisel the dots into this piece of metal. So I spent 20 minutes like hammering like Flintstones. Um, and then from then, you, you give the earplugs to your husband so you don't drive him crazy while you're destroying the hardware floor hammering. Um, and then at the end, you take the matches and you burn the book. Um, where you translated it, and I had to figure that out, right? And I'm in the crypto space, in Bitcoin. Um, if we want to get the next billion people into Bitcoin, that cannot be the way. We need much, much better ways for people to be able to download a wallet, for it to be intuitive to set up a wallet, for there to be easy on-ramps and off-ramps between the fiat world for people, especially for people who aren't crypto natives, aren't Bitcoin natives, and are buying their first Bitcoin. Um, we need easy ways to do key management and recovery when people forget their seed phrases, and all of that needs to exist. Um, so for us at TBD, building this foundational infrastructure is incredibly important. Um, we want to make it as easy as possible for developers to have all these primitives and to contribute to these primitives um, in order to advance the entire ecosystem so we can allow an ecosystem of innovation to flourish on top of decentralized technologies. Um, the third point I mentioned is representation. We need more builders in this space, and we need more builders that represent every gender, every race. Um, we need people from across the continent to be building um, because you're not gonna build for problems that you can't see. And we need people who are facing local problems, understand those dynamics deeply to be building for the future. Um, and so that's a big part of the TBD strategy as well is to not just do everything ourselves, but to engage a global community to be solving for local problems, um, leveraging the technologies that we make it very easy for people to do so. Thank you all for a wonderful panel discussion. I want to open up the last few minutes for any questions from the floor. OK, one, two, three. We're good. Thank you. Yep, four, OK. Uh, quick question. So I know you were talking about the on and off ramps um, into TBD, into the DEX, um, being through stable coins. But what about the on and off ramps into the stable coins themselves? Like, are you finding any challenges, or what do you think some of the solutions are for people changing their 
currency into a stable coin to get access to the to the actual decks. Can you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. So the question is, do you what are the challenges with getting um, the actual local currencies into stable coins and have those stable coins be used on the decks? Mm -hmm. Like what challenges are you finding with that? Got it, thank you. Um, it's a great question. Um, it sounds easy, creating a ubiquity of on and off ramps, but you're right. There's a, a ton of complexity that we're solving behind the scenes in order to make it seamless for builders and for wallets. Um, primary amongst that challenge is how do you establish trust, right? Because the minute that you touch the fiat system, the minute that you're touching the real world and I want to buy that hat from you for Bitcoin or I want to buy the shirt off your back for Bitcoin, I need to know that you're a real person. I need to know that you own that hat and you have title to that shirt. Um, and I need a way to establish trust. You need a way to establish trust knowing that I'm going to pay you for these goods, right? And so that's where TBD's Web5 efforts, um, our decentralized identity efforts, really underlie everything that we're doing to make this possible. There's a lot of very impressive DEXs in the world, and we're not trying to solve a problem that they're already solving well around atomic swaps. But the minute you touch fiat, the minute you touch commerce in the real world, you can't atomically swap your shirt for Bitcoin, right? Um, in order for me to get you into Bitcoin from fiat, um, that's where you touch regulated financial rails, right? And you need a way of establishing trust. And so that's the hard problem that our Web5 platform is tackling. Um, it's provisioning a way for, in a decentralized way for participants to negotiate the level of trust and information that they exchange amongst each other. Um, but doing it in, again, a decentralized, permissionless way, not in a centralized way, the way a lot of exchanges are doing it today. Um, and that's how we're trying to solve for some of these very, very hard problems that are going to bring the solutions into the mainstream. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Evelyn, and I don't know who I'm addressing, but um, I do love Bitcoin and everything about Bitcoin, but I'm just looking at it from the entrepreneurial perspective, i.e. that I am a farmer, and I've got a farm very far away from Accra, and we're talking about payments, receiving payments, and being represented in the fiat system, because if, for example, you are going to access a loan, they want to see a history of you taking any money, doing the transaction. So how can we bridge that gap? I mean, have you got any ideas how we receive payments using, I don't know, you had a little, you had a little box. Yes, and then, and then the, the panel from before, the guy also, had, how can we use these things? Yes, to have some kind of a record on fee and the banking system so that if you want to access grants and whatever, you do have a, I don't, do you get what I'm trying to? Yeah to say. And um, I'll probably talk about this and then kick it over to, to Obi who can talk more about how a federation could probably help with the loan aspect of that if you're in a community. But this is um, within the Bitcoin ecosystem. It's allowing you to accept offline payments using the Lightning Network, which will go to your own um, Bitcoin wallet or your Lightning channel at that point. But it's still not in the fiat system yet. For you to be able to interact with the fiat system, um, to Elaine's point, you need to have trust within either your community or a collaborative custody setup. And if you have a community system such as uh, Fediment with you know, your, your organization or your um, local uh, group, then someone in that local group could have access to a bank account that bridges the gap to be able to have fiat access. Um, and I don't know, you want to talk more about that too? Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting question. We've seen people talk about that in two different ways. I can give you two examples. One is through our friends at uh, Stackwork. So Stackwork allows you to um, perform tasks, data annotation tasks, for example, and earn money from them. And there's no identity required, no um, information required to log on, and you can start earning. Um, about during um, COVID and so on, there was people needed money for various reasons because they lost their jobs, etc. around the world. And um, the global south was no, no different. Um, and some people started coming up to the guys behind Stackwork who had been doing work um, and asked for loans for, for one purpose or another. And they didn't even, these people were all anonymous. They had no 
information about them. So they were thinking, well, what information do we have to be able to give a loan? Then they thought about it, and they realized that actually they do have information. They, they've seen their proof of work. They'd been working over this period of time and had been working, generating revenue, uh, improving their rating within the system, and they could use that as a proxy for credit worthiness, and so they were able to give them a loan based on this. So it was a different set of things to be able to use. And they have some of the lowest, and, and this worked, and they have some of the lowest levels of um, defaults on loans out there compared to the traditional system. So there are different mechanisms in which we can use proof of work, and this is actual physical work or mental work to provide a credit history for someone, even without having the traditional mechanisms that we have in the traditional system. So the, the only other example I would give is within Fedimint specifically, um, it's an extensible system and we're able to add functionality on it. Anything that you could put on an exchange, you could, you could put within a community wallet of Fedimint. And one thing that people are very interesting about, interested in is replicating systems that we already have in, um, we see across Africa, or across the global south actually. But in Africa, as you say, there are village savings and loan schemes, there are SACOs, etc. Um, and these are mechanisms where you can take a certain amount of money, uh, someone could add a module to a Fedimint module for your community where it made sense, to take that and, and supercharge it, turbocharge it. So you add privacy and so on, and, but you can automate these things. So once a month, everybody who's opted into that could have a small proportion of their, of their earnings put towards this sort of Fedimint community pool. And that can be used for a number of mechanisms. It could be used to underwrite a loan from another organization. So you go to another organization, like a bank, ask for a loan, but you'll normally get a swingingly high interest rate or not get the loan at all. But if it could be backed by the community saying, we've got this pot and we act like a guarantor, you can get a reasonable rate. You're more likely to pay it off and you build up a credit history. So these are just scratching the surface, but people are innovating every day around this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just one final saying. Um, I came to this conference. I didn't have a ticket. So yesterday, I was asked to buy a ticket online. Now, I use Revolut, and some of you might know this card in Europe and in the US, where you, it's like a debit card, but for travelers. It's, it's good to travel around. And October, November, I use a card easy all over Europe. But I get here yesterday and use the card, and it was declined simply because I was in Africa. That's the only conclusion I can draw. So when we come to Bitcoin and payments, this is the thing for Africa. Really, really is. I think we should all lend our support. I'm not the expert on crypto, but I love crypto for Africa for these kind of reasons. Then no longer would we be discriminated against because, because we live in Africa. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, hello everyone, my name is Yvonne Kagondu and thank you to the panelists for the insightful session. My question goes to Emily and Obi. And um, I'm part of an organization for women in blockchain in Kenya. And what we do is that we encourage women participation and employment in blockchain, specifically Kenyan women. And I say blockchain and not Bitcoin because a big challenge we face in Kenya is, and some parts of Africa is youth unemployment. And um, how I see, uh, and also going back to the, what Obi said about the most searched term in Africa is how to make money. And what I see with Bitcoin is that you have to first have money and then buy Bitcoin. And with blockchain, it has been the opposite. Blockchain has actually opened many job opportunities because it's of the funding they get, and there's more demand for jobs that women usually apply for, like community management, uh, marketing, and the likes. So my question is, how do we increase the opportunities and the jobs in Bitcoin specifically, because at the end of the day, we want Bitcoin adoption and not crypto, not blockchain. So what can we do to increase such opportunities in the Bitcoin ecosystem as opposed to blockchain? Thank you. So before you answer, who, who would want to answer, first of all? Any speaker would like to get on the question? 
I think he said me, but there was one. Uh, who else did you want to answer the question? Okay, so, um, Mr. Obi, um, yes. So, I, again, I've talked to a number, I'm blessed to have talked to a number of people, especially human rights activists from around the world. And one example who's here, I think she's talking later, is uh, Roya Maboub. Um, she's an incredible uh, woman, and uh, she's told me the, her story she, of um, Afghanistan and, the Middle, and later the Middle East region, where um, women were not able to work in the same companies as men for various reasons in certain countries. So she came up with an innovative solution, just make an all-women's company. And therefore, that sidestepped this, this problem. But then there was a separate problem. How do you, um, many women didn't have um, bank accounts separate from their, their husbands? So they didn't have financial self-sovereignty. So she sold that as well. And the answer there was Bitcoin. Because with Bitcoin, you can be your own bank. And so people were able to receive money directly without having any involvement from someone else. And that, again, was incredibly empowering. Since then, she's gone on to educate men and women all across the region. Um, but for, since 2014, she's been using Bitcoin as the mechanism to empower. But I think I want to um, go back to one of your core um, statements, which um, I did a talk earlier, and I talked about the fact that one of the attacks on Bitcoin is extreme misinformation. And one of these pieces of misinformation is the, is the untruth, let's put it that way, is the untruth that the only way you can get Bitcoin is by spending fiat. If you look at Bitcoin at global scale, we're not going to have 8 billion people all buying Bitcoin. The normal way in which people are going to acquire Bitcoin is by earning it. And anybody, even today, right now, I can show you the website, you can start earning money. You have to, you have to provide proof of work, but in place, you get sats, you get Bitcoin. You can do that right now. So, and, there are, and we and other organizations are the same, but we are working really hard to find other people around the world who need access to brains, but it doesn't matter where they are in the world to do that. And there's a growing number of those. Just as much as we're seeing this trend towards Bitcoin, there's another very large trend that's happening globally in technology, and that's that of AI. I study computer science and cognitive science at university, and I can tell you that AI is an, also an incredibly, um, is going to be an incredibly transformative technology, but it has an insatiable desire for data, annotated data, and that's only going to increase. But it doesn't matter where in the world you do this, as long as you're a human being, you can do this task. And as, a, and as an employer, I'm going to want the person who's going to be the work, work hardest for it and is going to be able to have the keenest price. This is the first time where a technology can be provided where we in the global south are having an advantage over people in the west. So this is going to lead to massive job creation across the west, across the global south, and Fedi will be part of that, male or female. Hello, there we go. We are over time, and I, so I've been told to cut the question, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, and it's going to be spicy for you, Lawrence. So as someone who works in Bitcoin developer education, there's a mismatch between us saying we want more builders from this part of the world and us actually employing them. And so we are constantly seeing examples of um, opportunities as these piecemeal tasks. Anywhere in the world you can do this, but they're only you're not employing them, you're actually creating a very tenuous connection to them. And so the question is, and we, we, we do this for the Western world, we, we're willing to make these mutual commitments. Um, and so the question is, why is that and how do we fix it? You want me to answer that? 
Sorry. Um, this was directed to the people who have control over the hiring process, so any of the, the three hirers. Well, uh, my, my side would be, um, again, this is where someone like Royal would be a, an incredible example. Started off with simple data annotation tasks, but now she's training people on um, programming. On she, she was responsible for the first women's all robotics team in, in Afghanistan. Um, and now people are working on very high-end tasks, to say programming, um, design, etc. So you start somewhere and you expand from there. And that will be our plan. We're working with NGOs in um, Kenya, like Next Step, they do the same. They start with simple tasks, but they expand, and they train, and they build from there. And I think um, I agree with Obi. Like, don't underestimate the, the power when people start to make money. Now, the last three years have been misled with like, you know, coins. But as soon as they know how they can make uh, money in a sustainable way in the future, because the only sustainable thing is that's going to last, um, they're going to storm the doors. Mm -hmm. So I think. Um, you know, there's also this company called Stackworks you should check out there. They have, you know, these, um, you know, you can do AI work um, and get paid in SATs daily. So I think it's happening already and, 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 and the feedback is great. And um, as soon as the word gets out that, you know, your family members, your cousin is making $10 a day, you know, people will storm the doors. So I think um, it's happening and it's exciting to see. And that's going to that's gonna def definitely change Bitcoin and bring more stability in the price as well. I had an interesting conversation last night where we were talking about the difference between empowering people to build and to participate um, versus doing to or doing for. Um, and I, I think that's something we really have to keep in mind as we're trying to spread these technologies and bring these technologies and the benefits to people around the world is how can we provide them with the tools and the education to do so, um, but not try to do it for people. Um, if they're in a better position to understand their local challenges, their local problems, um, a lot of it comes down to internet access, um, understanding how to start coding and building, understanding how to start contributing, and for us, building a lot of the foundational primitives that will unlock that. And even open source itself isn't enough. It really, to us, is thinking through that full stack. And we can't play every role, but that's where I think organizations like Be Trust and a lot of other local organizations are very amazing. And if we can all partner and come together, I think we can create a very um, robust way to empower people to start building. And I hope I answered the right question because I blew out my ear diving and I, I don't know that I caught your full question, but I'm answering that anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the one thing I'll add to it is uh, I did a panel yesterday on careers in Bitcoin, and I think um, it's, it's very important to remember that there, there are companies here in Ghana as well that will be creating these kind of jobs that need that same brain power, you know, exactly where they are without needing to remote travel or, you know, so I think that looking inwards is just as powerful as looking to other companies to provide employment. And that's going to, you know, generate a, a level of sovereignty for that person that, you know, is is unparalleled. Like to your point, it's never before in the history of humanity have we seen the shift in potential from um, the first world developed nations to places that that have the brain power but not the resources. So, internal first, in my opinion. Awesome. Thank you very much. That we all for the questions. Thank you.